To make a donation, visit biblicallycorrectpodcast.org slash donate. And if you enjoy this episode, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Thank you for your support. Is Yeshua really coming back soon? Welcome to the Biblically Correct Podcast. Shalom, y'all. This is the Biblically Correct Podcast, teaching biblical correctness in a biblically incorrect world. My name is Kevin Jeffrey. I'm a Jewish follower of the Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, and I love teaching the scriptures. Make no mistake, the Master Yeshua is coming again. This Yeshua, who was taken up from you into the heaven, will come in just the same way you saw him going on to the heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The Master himself, with a shout, with the voice of a chief messenger, and with the shofar of God, will come down from heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, apart from being a sin offering to those waiting for him to salvation. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And immediately after the oppression of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven, and then all the nations of the earth will beat the breast in grief, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the heaven with power and much glory. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 30. The scriptures make it abundantly clear. Yeshua is coming again. He'll return in glorious triumph, ushering in the day of the end and bringing with him both judgment and salvation. But when exactly will he return? How much longer do we have to wait? For 2,000 years, it's been a subject of great debate and speculation. But is his inevitable return really as imminent as many would like to believe? Is it true that right now, especially at this increasingly chilling time in modern history, that Yeshua could return at any moment. Let's see what the scriptures say. First of all, we know that the Bible indicates that we should expect him soon. But how soon is soon? Yaakov, James chapter 5, verse 8, says that the coming presence of the Master has drawn near. And Hebrews eleven thirty seven 37 says, For in yet a very little while, he who is coming will come, and will not delay. And in several places in the book of Revelation, Yeshua himself says, I come quickly. So the scriptures say that Yeshua's return is already near, and that his coming is in a very little while without delay. For the biblical authors then, there definitely seemed to be an expectation and hope for Yeshua's impending arrival. Even the words of Yeshua himself affirm that he is coming quickly. And yet, we also see them tempering that expectation with patience, as Yaakov does in verse 7, saying, Be patient then, brothers, until the coming presence of the Master. So, given that we've been waiting for this quickly coming swift return for 2,000 years, how should we understand such a long delay? Well, Kepha tells us exactly how in 2 Kepha, Peter, chapter 3. In the eventual end of days, there will come scoffers, with their scoffing, going on according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming presence? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things remain this way from the beginning of the creation. But let this one thing not be unobserved by you, loved ones, that one day with Adonai is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Adonai is not slow in regard to the promise, as certain ones count slowness." So while from our perspective, 2,000 years can seem unbelievably slow, Kepha is telling us that to Adonai, a day may as well be a thousand years. This means that God will keep his promise and Yeshua will return. Only it will not be fast or slow according to how we define those terms. So while to us, quickly and in a very little while and without delay, all understandably mean the not-too-distant future, in this case, they apparently mean something else, because here we are, still waiting. In addition to what the scriptures say about how soon we should expect him, the second thing we know is that his arrival will be unexpected. 
Though the Bible tells us the signs of his coming and to be ready and watchful for them, the exact timing of his return will still be unpredictable. Yeshua makes this point multiple times in Matthew chapter 24, as he does in verse 36, which says that concerning that day and hour, no one has known, not even the messengers of the heavens, nor the Son, except the Father only. And in verse 44, he says, because of this, you also become ready, because in whatever time you do not think he will arrive, the Son of Man comes. Paul also says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, for you yourselves have known thoroughly that the day of Adonai will come in this way, as a thief in the night. So no one knows, nor can they predict the exact timing of when Yeshua is coming back. We're to be ready and awake, looking for the signs of his coming and the full end of the age. But no matter what we may see or think we may see, we will still be surprised when it happens. So the Bible says that Yeshua is coming quickly, but apparently not as we count quickness. And it says that there will be signs forecasting his return, yet it will still be unexpected. So the question is, does this soon unexpected return mean that his coming is imminent? At this time, right now in world history, could Yeshua's return happen at any moment? And the answer, sadly, is no. As we stand right now, he will not come. He cannot come before the most ignored, prophetic, major historical event that he himself says will precede his coming. And that is the national belief and acceptance of him as Messiah by the Jewish people. The Master Yeshua says, beginning in Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, you that are killing the prophets and stoning those sent to you, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under the wings. Yet you did not want it. Look, your house is left deserted to you. For I say to you, you will not see me from now on until you say, Blessed is he who is coming in the name of Adonai. The Master Yeshua speaking to Jerusalem says, You will not see me from now on until you say, Blessed is he who is coming in the name of Adonai. But who does the Master mean by Jerusalem? These verses follow a lengthy chastisement of the scribes and Pharisees who Yeshua warned the people about and then condemned as hypocrites and blind guides. And though it's not entirely clear who Yeshua is addressing by the time he begins calling out to Jerusalem in verse 37, based on the context of the previous three verses, Yeshua seems to now be speaking more generally to include all Israel. But whether Jerusalem here represents just Israel's unrighteous teachers and leaders, or the people living in Jerusalem at that time, or all Jewish people throughout the generations, with the capital city symbolizing the heart of the entire nation, the end result is the same. Yeshua is lamenting how Israel rejected and killed those sent to them by God, and sees them rejecting him the same way. As Messiah, he wants to gather the children of Israel together, to lead and care for them as a hen gathers her chicks. Yet, as he says, they don't want it. And so, speaking to the heart of Israel, he says, You will not see me from now on until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who is coming in the name of Adonai. So he's quoting Psalm 118.26 here, the same psalm that talks about the cornerstone that the builders rejected a reference that Yeshua had previously made about himself. So he's essentially saying that until the collective Jewish heart acknowledges that he was sent in the name and power and authority of the God of Israel, until the Jewish people believe that he is the promised Messiah, we will not see him again. The acceptance of Yeshua by the Jewish people is the historic and prophetic linchpin that is holding back the countdown to Yeshua's return. So what does this mean for Yeshua coming back? It means that his coming is not imminent. It can't happen at any time. And that until Israel believes and confesses that Yeshua is the Messiah, 
until the Jewish people praise Yeshua with one voice, blessed is he who is coming in the name of Adonai, so that they can then look to him whom they have pierced, Yeshua's quick, undelayed return will be indefinitely on pause. It's not that God isn't ready or able to fulfill his promise at any moment. It's not that we're waiting on him despite all appearances. It's that this whole time, God has been waiting on us. Going back to Peter, Kepha chapter 3, verse 9, the complete verse says, Adonai is not slow in regard to the promise, as certain ones count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wanting any to be lost, but all to pass on to reformation. And speaking of that day of judgment when Yeshua comes, he goes on in verses 11 and 12 to say, with all these being dissolved in this way, what kind of people ought you to be in holy behavior and godly acts? The kind who are waiting for and hastening the coming presence of the day of God. So the apparent slowness of the coming of Yeshua and the day of God is because God has hit pause on his plans while he patiently waits for us. What's he waiting for? For us to live our lives in such a way that speeds up Yeshua's return. And what way of life is that? One that's lived by holy behavior and godly acts, which I believe includes facilitating the salvation of Israel. In God's plan for the reconciliation of the world, according to Romans 11, salvation came to the Gentiles by way of the Jewish people's rejection of Yeshua. But that widespread Gentile salvation was also not without an ulterior purpose. As Paul says in verse 11, it was to arouse Israel to jealousy. And he continues on in verse 13 to suggest a course of action. He says, I will glorify my service if by any means I will arouse to jealousy those of my own flesh and will save some of them. For if their rejection of Messiah is a reconciliation of the world, what will their reception of him be if not life out of the dead? So Paul is indicating both for himself as a Jew and for the Gentile audience to which he's writing here that we should all follow God's lead in the jealous arousal of his people. Paul says that his service to Messiah would be glorified if by any means he was able to arouse the Jewish people to jealousy so that they would be saved. So while their rejection of Yeshua means the reconciliation of the world, it's their reception of Yeshua, their acceptance of him as Messiah, that would be life out of the dead. This statement takes on even more meaning when we also consider what Paul says about Yeshua's return, again, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The Master himself will come down from heaven, and the dead in Messiah will rise first. The coming of Yeshua, which is set in motion through Israel's salvation, brings life out of the dead. This is an event that not only is God waiting to fulfill based on our behavior and actions, but the coming of which we ourselves can speed up by provoking the Jewish people to belief and therefore salvation in Yeshua. So if Yeshua's return is not imminent, if his coming is on hold until the Jewish people collectively believe in Yeshua, and if that belief depends even in part on us as Messiah followers, provoking the Jewish people to jealousy, then the question remains, what are we going to do about it? What must we do to help save all Israel and therefore hasten the return of Yeshua? Well, the first thing we need to do is abandon the idea that Yeshua could come back at any moment. As long as we absolve ourselves of any responsibility for the timing of his return, we will remain completely unmotivated to act as agents of Israel's salvation. As Dr. David Stern puts it, the fact that Yeshua will not return until Israel receives national salvation is a powerful motivator for evangelizing Jewish people. Or at least it should be, but it's not. On the contrary, there are Christian doctrines that relegate Israel's national salvation to a time of tribulation, or at the actual site of Yeshua's coming with the clouds, or during some other so-called dispensation, none of which can account for Yeshua's own words in Matthew 23. 
We need to accept the fact that Yeshua will continue to wait on us until all Israel is saved. Second, we need to understand Yeshua apart from the identity he's been given in Christianity and restore his Jewishness as well as that of the New Covenant Scriptures. A foreign god will never provoke God's people to jealousy. He'll only provoke them. And that's what Jesus is to most Jews. At best, a messianic imposter. At worst, a foreign god. Being able to understand the New Covenant Scriptures as a Jewish document and to portray Yeshua as neither the founder of Christianity nor as a rabbi of Judaism, but as the quintessential model of a scripturally faithful Jew is the necessary foundation for any authentic presentation of him as Israel's Messiah. Third, we need to stop treating our own edification and personal relationship with God as the goal of our walk with Yeshua, and instead remember that it was always supposed to be a means to an end, namely, to prepare us to share Yeshua with others and make disciples. Even when it comes to Jewish things like Torah-keeping and feast-keeping, and especially things like debates about the name of God and so forth. These things are futile if they don't equip us and lead us to reach out with the unobstructed message of Yeshua's salvation. If we're constantly inward-focused or caught up in fruitless debates, we won't ever be the kind of people that will provoke jealousy in others, much less hasten the Master's return. We need to reflect Messiah in our actions and be ready with a biblical answer on our lips if we can ever have hope of being his true representatives and cause other people to be envious of what we have in him. Fourth, as Messiah followers, we need to be biblically correct and of the same mind where it comes to understanding the scriptures and how we see and interact with the world. For as splintered as the Jewish community is, a Jew is still a Jew, and that camaraderie and connection exists regardless of background, geography, and experience. For them to then look at us and see us not only as deluded or liars or hypocrites, but as hopelessly divided in our denominational and individual beliefs and practices, our collective voice will never be sufficiently multiplied to reach the national conscience of a people such as the Jewish people. We need to be perfectly united in the same mind and the same judgment, as Paul says, so that at every turn, the Jewish people are continually seeing and hearing one unified representation and message about the one true Messiah of Israel. And last, we need to purpose and be prepared to share Yeshua with Jewish people. As Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, How then may they call upon him in whom they did not believe? And how may they believe on him of whom they did not hear? And how may they hear apart from one proclaiming? Nearly every Jew on planet earth today has never heard of the real Yeshua, but only a Christian caricature or a watered-down, unbiblical distortion. So it's up to us to set the record straight. Jewish people also need to hear not the pat Christian gospel message, but your testimony about how God saved you and changed you and transformed your life. But the part of the message that will really force them to face their destiny is how, in the beginning, sin broke the relationship between God and man, but that the God of Israel then chose to set apart every Jew by birth for the unique purpose of reconciling the entire world back to him. As Paul says to the Jews in Acts chapter 13, verse 47, quoting Isaiah 49, 6, For so has Adonai commanded us, Jews, I have set you as a light for the goyim, the Gentiles, for your being for salvation to the end of the earth. And this carries even more weight when we hear the master telling his Jewish audience in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, And this good news of the reign will be proclaimed in all the world for a testimony to all the Gentiles, and then will the end arrive. Every Jewish person needs to hear and understand that the only way to fulfill their destiny and purpose as Jews and to receive this God-given birthright begins with accepting that he has a long-lost brother named Yeshua, and that this Yeshua, the Son of God, 
is Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the world. The scriptures teach and promise us that Yeshua is coming again. It's inevitable. It's near. It's happening in a very little while, and it's coming without delay. We are to remain awake, looking for the signs of his coming, working while it is still day, and awaiting his glorious and triumphant return. But the scriptures also teach us to be patient, because a day to God may come at any speed he wishes, and he is not slow as we count slowness. And though we remain ready, we will still be surprised when he arrives, because no one but the Father knows that day and hour. And though Yeshua says he is coming quickly and that there will be signs foretelling his return, the Master also teaches us that the end is not yet, and his coming, as we stand today, right now, is not imminent. It has been deferred, put on pause, until such a time that all Israel, the Jewish people, praise Yeshua saying, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, and restart the countdown to Yeshua's return. As followers of Messiah, this is our time to accept responsibility to hasten Yeshua's return, because that's what our God has been waiting patiently for us to do. Let us stop looking to the sky, hoping to see a sight that cannot yet come. Instead, let us accept the task before us to prepare and purpose to do our part to help all Israel fulfill theirs. Come quickly, Master Yeshua. Draw your Jewish people, Messiah of Israel. Be coming soon. God is waiting on Israel. Israel is waiting on you. So what are you, child of God, going to do? Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Biblically Correct Podcast. If you like this episode or want to see us make more, then we need your help. Visit our website at biblicallycorrectpodcast.org to support the work of Perfect Word Ministries and MJMI with your much-needed donations. And of course, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell to receive notifications whenever a new episode is posted. If you have any questions about this teaching or if there are any other topics you'd like to see me cover, leave me a comment or shoot me an email at kevin at perfectword.org. That's kevin at perfectword.org. Until next time, remember that every scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for refuting, for setting a right, and for instruction that is in righteousness so that the man of God may be fully equipped, having been completed for every good act. Shalom.